Welcome back to Reimagine 2020. I'm Yona Hockhauser, and today I'm glad to be joined by Joe Lelouz, CEO of Bison Trails. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me, Yona. I'm really, really glad to be here and uh, excited to talk about all things blockchain. Well, that's you came to the right place. We are going to talk blockchain and a lot of it. But, but, but before we, we really get into the meat of things, want to kind of give the viewers a background on who you are and how you got into blockchain yourself. Definitely. Um, so, uh, like you said, I'm Joe Lelouz. I'm the CEO of Bison Trails. Uh, Bison Trails is an infrastructure company that focuses on providing uh, secure, reliable access uh, to blockchains um, for some of the world's largest custodians, exchanges, app developers, uh, funds, token holders um, across a whole multitude of different blockchains. Um, I, uh, I got into the blockchain space. Um, I, actually, I got into the blockchain space kind of m mostly because I'm, I'm just a huge nerd. Uh, I've been a, uh, a startup founder for my whole career. So I've, I've started a number of uh, venture backed uh, tech companies, uh, and, uh, but have been a technical founder my, my entire career as well. So uh, I have an engineering background and uh, love, love software. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, I got in the blockchain space um, pretty early, but I would say started working in the blockchain space pretty late in a sense that a lot of the other nerds around me uh, were really interested in Bitcoin when Bitcoin came out. Um, I would say, you know, to be fully you know, honest with myself and, and you know, with folks tuning in, uh, I wasn't convinced that Bitcoin was going to change the world when Bitcoin came out. I was like, this is really, really cool and super nerdy and a weird, you know, new decentralized form of currency. Uh, I was interested in it and I decided I wanted to follow along, but I did, you know, I wasn't, uh, what, what's the expression, accumulating bags of Bitcoin <laughs> since day zero. Um, I bet but, you regret uh, that now. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely regret that now. Uh, there's a lot of things I definitely regret with my, uh, my, my, the work I've done with Bitcoin over the years. Um, but yeah, so, so I, uh, you know, at the, at the time I was actually working on a completely different startup. Uh, I started this company called Grand Street. Uh, it was an online marketplace for new creative tech. So we were working with uh, some of the world's uh, newest uh, creative device makers. So people that were leaving places like Samsung and Apple and uh, wanted to build a new uh, piece of hardware. Uh, and uh, so this is a re really interesting startup. Um, we ended up selling the company to Etsy, which is uh, you know a leading marketplace, an online marketplace for uh, creativity. Um, and I joined the leadership team over there. Um, I was also running a, a business unit uh, at Etsy focused on um, uh, seller services, so building products and services to help people scale their businesses. Um, and so, in a lot of ways, my career is kind of sort of gravitated around this idea of breaking down barriers and democratizing access to tools to make new technology easier. Um, in particular, with Grand Street, it was all about manufacturing. Manufacturing was really difficult. Uh, if you had a new idea, it would be kind of, you know, I don't want to say easy, but easier nowadays to prototype it. Uh, you can use sort of open hardware systems, but uh, it was pretty hard to scale. If you wanted to like build something and actually like sell it to people, uh, it was pretty hard to scale. And so the whole idea was we wanted to build APIs into this manufacturing process. Um, because of that, I ended up spending a lot of time uh, in, in China, uh, in, in Shenzhen, uh, where a lot of uh, electronics manufacturing happens uh, and got to know some folks over there, which um, I'll, I'll put a pin in it, but it's kind of an important piece of the story of like how I ended up doing what I was doing in, in the blockchain space. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, uh, really have, have a, have had a focus, a, a career focus on, on entrepreneurship, um, uh, starting new companies, uh, also, also been an angel investor in a lot of, uh, new tech, uh, new tech companies as well. Um, I'm based uh, out of New York on the East coast. So work with a lot of uh, early stage founders on the East coast and uh, plenty of them in Silicon Valley as well. And honestly, all over the world uh, nowadays. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's sort of been, uh, my start. Um, well, 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 yeah. well, let's talk, let's talk about where you are now. You're CEO of Bison Trails and you, you touched upon it a little bit saying that you guys are an infrastructure company. Um, yeah. What does that mean? I mean, it, 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 isn't blockchain itself the infrastructure? It is. Um, so th that's actually a great question. And it's, it's something that we get asked. I mean, it, 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 we get asked that pretty often, um, not because, uh, you know, mostly because the infrastructure in the blockchain space is nuanced and difficult. Um, so uh, Bison Trails, as it uh, manifested, um, was really my co-founder and I and um, 
you'll probably hear me talk about Aaron, my co-founder, quite a bit because we've been working together for uh, almost 20 years. We've actually built uh, all the companies that we've built over the last uh, little while. We've actually worked together. We've been co-founders for that for that entire period, um, and we worked in Etsy together, etc. Um, and and when we started building Bison Trails, which quite frankly we didn't know we were building Bison Trails at the time, we were you know just messing around in the blockchain space. Um, we found ourselves uh, building bits and pieces of, of infrastructure code to interact with blockchains. Um, so yes, you're right. Blockchain itself is a piece of infrastructure. It's a, it's a technology. Um, and, and a lot of times I'll sort of abstract away from blockchain as a technology and say things like crypto networks or transfer of value networks or, uh, or, or you know, crypto asset networks, because um, some of them don't even use blockchains and people don't even realize it. Um, for instance, you know, a, a really great example, it would be Libra, which I've been, you know, Bison Trails and myself have been pretty heavily involved in and I'm on the technical steering committee uh, is technically a Merkle tree. It's not a blockchain. Uh, so <laughs> um, from a technology perspective, um, we try to abstract that away, but it is a, uh, a tech advancement that is a piece of infrastructure. Um, not to get too sort of fundamental, but blockchains essentially, or, or transfer value networks or crypto networks are really a, a protocol or a set of instructions that a group of people that are decentralized, a group of people, a group of actors in a network that are decentralized need to follow for, uh, you know, correctness in, in a, 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 a system. Uh, and, and, and so you can think of that as infrastructure in a sense that it's the rules you have to follow. Um, however, to be able to follow those rules, you need to be able to do things. And in particular with, with crypto networks, it's, uh, you know, power, compute, transfer messages, uh, validate messages, produce messages, secure messages. And so um, in older, uh, in older uh, blockchains that, normal, that use uh, a consensus mechanism uh, like Bitcoins called proof of work, that's all, a lot of that is done by uh, what folks refer to as miners. So you have these like hardware uh, assistant, they have these like computers that are specialized specifically for mining and they do some of the stuff, they produce blocks and validate blocks, et cetera. Um, however, you would kind of view those as pieces of infrastructure in the blockchain space, but you know, people don't really talk about it so, so much. So um, what we did was uh, we were building different software components that were enabling us to interact with blockchains. And you know, in a lot of ways that is still considered underlying infrastructure. Um, what we found was that it didn't matter which blockchain we were working on uh, or which blockchain we were trying to interact with, whether it was Bitcoin or Ethereum or a whole slew of new networks that we current, that Bison Trails currently supports on our platform, uh, a lot of the core components to interacting with a blockchain were actually quite similar. Uh, and so, you know, we, we kind of looked at each other and we said, wow, we've like tried to build a few different products and services in the space. And um, at one point we were building a wallet at some, another point we were building, and these were all sort of experiments. Um, at another point we were building um, some bots that were working in decentralized exchanges. And we realized that it didn't matter what the end result was that we were trying to build. We still kept repeating these sort of like underlying pieces of secure, reliable access um, to these chains. And so, by so, so who, who's, yeah. who's using that service? Who's using that that service? Because um, you know the, the the problem is clearly there. A lot of people might be interested in interacting with the blockchain, but it's really tough and confusing uh, and code intensive to interact with the blockchain. So. Is this like, you know, the, the, the average geek in his basement wants to run a node and come to you? Or is this like big enterprise uh, you know, institution that says, hey, we want to do some major work on this blockchain and we're going to come to you because we don't know the first thing about blockchain? Yeah. Um, so it's actually, that's a, again, that's a really interesting question because it kind of is neither of those. And it's a whole different, currently a different category of folks. Um, the thing about the sort of geek in their basement that wants to run a node, sure, they can definitely come to us. Um, but the reality is, is that they may not need the type of mission critical systems that the Bison Trails platform supports. So the whole idea around Bison Trails was how do we take what is essentially beta software, so blockchain software, that's beta software, and make it as reliable as if you were building on something that was you know, 20 years in industry. Um, and that's a really difficult thing to do. So if I'm a no, uh, if I'm a you know a, a geek builder in my basement, I don't actually care if the node that I'm operating is you know distributed all around the world and redundant, and, and I don't care if it's gone down for six hours because I might not be even working on it or using it. Um, and if I'm a brand new company that's never done anything in the blockchain space, I don't know. Let's just say I'm a bank and I'm a new bank and I'd like to start adding you know uh, crypto assets to, 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 you know, my banking, my retail banking platform. Um, 
I, I, you know, probably have those needs from a, from a enterprise grade perspective. Um, but I don't really know where to start. So what we've, what we've seen in the crypto space, and this is, this is interesting is that over the last decade or so, there's been a few companies, quite a few companies that have been built and they, they built every single piece of infrastructure from literally zero all the way to the user experience themselves. And this is kind of, uh, atypical in the tech space. It's, it's typical in early and nascent markets, but pretty atypical in mature markets. So if you look at the internet, for instance, the internet, I'm using the internet very broadly right now, <laughs> uh, and, and that's on purpose, uh, because there is a whole slew of markets and industries and companies that are focused on different pieces of the technology stack. However, companies like, you know, uh, you know some of the major exchanges, for instance, like Coinbase or something, uh, they didn't have the opportunity to work with service providers and companies that were focused on infrastructure because they didn't exist. And so, you know, th that team would have to go and build everything from the ground up and from zero, uh, which is great uh, because they've, you know, been able to do fantastic uh, work. But as you start to expand and add new blockchains and new protocols, that becomes incredibly cumbersome. And this was kind of our, uh, Aaron and I's realization when we started working on Bison Trails was the world of blockchains is expanding. There isn't you know, just one, there isn't just Bitcoin, there isn't just Ethereum. We're actually seeing a tremendous amount of growth in new protocols, in protocols that interact with each other, in protocols that are these expensive ecosystems. Uh, and there needs to be an infrastructure company that makes it easier for new entrepreneurs, builders, products and service providers um, to interact with all of them because just doing one is hard enough. Uh, and so what we found is that a lot of the folks that use our platform and use our product uh, are folks that are, you know, have some kind of, uh, uh, have some kind of existing product in the space or they're trying to build a new product and a new protocol and they, or they'd like to build a product that would support many different protocols. And they come to us uh, and they have mission critical infrastructure needs. So they have, you know, millions and millions of users or uh, they're planning to have millions and millions of users and they want to have something that's hyper secure, hyper reliable uh, and super easy to use. Mm -hmm. Now, now, one of those, uh, you know, mission critical, uh, I, I, it's a great phrase. I'm going to start using that more, mission critical. It sounds really legit. One of those other, uh, those mission <laughs> critical, uh, yeah, yeah um, you know, assets that you provide to companies is this idea of, um, of, of, of anti-slashing uh, or taking out the risk of slashing for proof of stake, which is something yeah. that, you know, honestly, you probably would not even know exists unless you run uh, unless you're, uh, you're running a node on a proof of stake network. So why don't you explain to the audience real quick, what is slashing and, and what do you guys do to prevent it? Absolutely. So um, first, thing, first things first about slashing is uh, in line with our mission and our vision to make uh, democratize access to blockchains and make it easier for folks to build and, and uh, support uh, products and services in the space. We've been building technology that, that, that helps move that forward. And um, we recently announced uh, uh, that we uh, had, had um, put out a new piece of software uh, called double signing protection that helps prevent against slashing events. Um, and like you said, that's a kind of a nuanced concept, but if you're actually working and building the proof of stake space, you, you sort of understand what it is. Um, so the idea behind slashing, and this is kind of goes back to what I was saying before, like a blockchain as a piece of infrastructure is really just a set of rules. So it's a protocol. It's a set of, of concepts that everyone that's engaging in it needs to follow to, to for correctness. Um, what newer, blockchains, in particular blockchains that use proof of stake as a consensus mechanism, and we can talk about proof of stake a little bit more if you'd like, uh, it, th they've implemented means uh, to, to uh, essentially penalize folks that go against the protocol. Uh, and one of the major ways you can go against the rule set is by signing two blocks uh, in the same time period. The reason why that's considered bad is it becomes very confusing for everyone else in the network, in, in the blockchain, uh, to understand what is real and what is true. And so it can bring, it can slow networks down, it can bring, bring them to a halt, it can make it much harder to produce new more blocks, and there's a lot of trickle down effects. And so um, what a lot of modern uh, protocol builders and protocol teams have done is they've implemented this idea of slashing. So uh, in the same way that uh, folks that produce blocks, sign blocks, verify blocks in a new proof of stake network get rewarded for doing so, um, if they act either maliciously or accidentally against the protocol, um, they get what's called slash. And that is they take uh, the protocol automatically takes a portion of the value that is being staked on the nodes for this network. So this is kind of getting into fundamentals of proof of stake. 
um, and it slashes them, essentially gets rid of them, you lose them. So some, in some protocols that goes into a central treasury that the, the community governs and uh, will distribute out to, for other reasons. And in some protocols, it actually just gets burned entirely and doesn't exist anymore and you know, has kind of economic uh, uh, um, implications for everyone else that's holding a token. And so different protocols kind of handle that differently. But the whole idea behind slashing is if you mess up or you do something malicious, you get punished for it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, an economic disincentive. And uh, what we've done is we've written software that helps protect against some of the most common and most egregious ways of messing up. Um, mm -hmm. So if you think of it, it's not so much that it's impossible to do. It's just that there are lots of ways to accidentally mess the, you know, mess up participating in the protocol. Uh, we make it super easy to not mess up. <laughs> um, and so that, that matters a lot. If uh, you're engaging and you have customers that are potentially using your, exchange or your, your custody product or your wallet, and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, that they're not losing their, their, uh, their tokens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always enjoy speaking to people who actually work in code and develop on the different blockchain protocols, uh, because as opposed to speaking to just a pundit, just a trader, someone who just interacts with the front end of a network, I, I really like speaking to someone who develops because they understand, you understand the intricacies of, hey, you know, th th there's something that's limiting my ability to, 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 to program a function here. There's something about this blockchain that's enabling me to, yeah. to, to code and, and to uh, add new features to it. So my question to you is, is this, you know, you're interacting with proof of work or proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, proof of authority. I mean, there's really tons of, uh, uh, of ways of running these things. And uh, in your experience on the developer side, uh, wh what have you found or which blockchain have you found is you find it is the, not, not only does it hold you back, but mm. actually enables you and empowers you as a developer to add functionality to it. Mm. That's, so um, that's, that's a tough question, mostly because uh, the pace of innovation in the blockchain space right now, um, I, I mean, probably always, most of, most of the time I've been involved, uh, has been insane, like breakneck speed. Um, and and uh, protocols, the folks building on top of protocols, building either layer twos or, or products and services um, is happening incredibly fast. Uh, and like I said, I've been a, a tech founder for a long time. I've worked you know, mostly in uh, old web uh, systems prior to uh, building in the blockchain space. Uh, and in those, the, you know, the innovation pace there was, was pretty fast as well. This is, you know, something that I've never seen before. So it's incredible to be around some of the smartest and most interesting people I've ever met and watching them build and innovate and, and iterate. Um, the reason why the question is hard is because different protocols and different blockchains are kind of in different stages of their life cycles. Um, and so if you take Bitcoin, which is a decade old, uh, it's one of the more mature uh, protocols. However, the, the pace at which innovation is happening on Bitcoin is, um, I don't want to say sl necessarily slower, but you know, people are pretty cautious. It has a lot of value. They want to make sure they don't mess up the protocol and they want to make sure that products and services being built around it are well thought out. Uh, and, um, are, are, you know, that often, uh, equates moving a little bit slower. Then you have something like Ethereum, which is, you know, both a, a crypto network as well as, you know, designed to be a, a world, you know, a world computer. Uh, and it's literally designed for people to innovate on it, um, uh, which is quite different from some of its predecessors. And so that's, that's quite unique. Um, I would say in today, point in time, if I were to like take that evaluation right now, Ethereum has an unrivaled developer community uh, of, any, of any blockchain uh, today. Um, what I will say is that it has a five year head start on some of its, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna use the, you know, Ethereum killers or competitors, because I think nowadays that people are more focused on how to uh, blockchains interact and interop versus compete or kill each other. Um, but some of the newer protocols that are coming out, things like Polkadot, Cosmos, um, even Tezos, that's been out for a bit, uh, they have really thriving developer communities as well, as well. They're continuing to grow and they're making innovations in their own, in their own areas. So Polkadot came out and it's really focused on uh, deploying and, and building sharded parachains, um, which is, you know, in theory, much, much can produce uh, transactions much, much faster uh, than, than an Ethereum can today. Um, you know, things like Cosmos has been focused on in, entirely on, on interoperability. Uh, and there's a ton of innovation that's have been happening in interchain interoperability in the Cosmos side of things. And I think what we're starting to see is that those pieces are coming together um, from different protocols. And that's really unique for Bison Trails is that we are, you know, protocol agnostic and we're squarely helping each of these different protocols 
Um, and so we're seeing the different pieces kind of come together. And, and, and you know, you, you're protocol agnostic. So then my question is this, you guys are also a member of the Libra Association. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you kind of have your, your foot in, in, in let's say, in, in both circles over here where, where the, the more community driven uh, grassroots uh, uh, side of things, and then, you know, what's viewed as the more corporate, uh, you know, essentially Facebook run, even though they don't run it, it's association, we're not involved, but it's basically Facebook's uh, association. Um, so you, you mentioned that you're on the, the technical uh, side of, of, of the Libra Association. So maybe yeah. you could give us a, a, as much as you can, a peel back the veil there, you know, kind of, uh, who are, are the people who are running it, are people working on it? Are those the same type of people that you're interacting with at Polkadot, uh, with, with Cosmos, with Ethereum? Are these the same type of, hey, we, we just love crypto guys, are these more corporate? Um, and, and, and really, do you feel that there's kind of a, a, a corporate hand on, on, on the steering wheel there? Yeah, um, I think, you know, two, two things about uh, myself and about Bison Trails. I think that we are, uh, you know, probably to a fault transparent and honest with ourselves about what we're engaged in and why. Um, and also, uh, we've been deliberately protocol agnostic since the beginning, uh, since the beginning of the company. Um, you know, both from a strategy perspective as well as from an ethos perspective. Um, I look at this as we are a, uh, you know, we're a pure play technology provider. We're focused on making the technology more accessible, easier to use and better. And a little bit less focused on the sort of politics and, um, you know, hand waving and yelling about like who's running what and who's doing what and why. Um, and that, that kind of bleeds into sort of all of our opinions around everything from the, whether it's the protocols we engage with all the way through to, you know, our, how we feel about, you know, pure decentralization. And we can talk about that a little bit if, you, if, you, if you're interested. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So we are a founding member of the Libra Association. And so we are a member of the Libra Association. I'm also, I have, was elected by the association to be on the technical steering committee. Uh, what the technical steering committee does, um, like most open source projects, uh, guides the open source development of the Libra blockchain, um, which is a great thing. Um, and one of the things that I'm super proud of uh, from Libra is the, the technology work that's been done on the Libra blockchain and in particular move, uh, move the, the VM and the smart contracting language. It's incredible. It's one of the best ones I think I've ever seen and worked with. Um, it's a fantastic product. And, you know, whether you, whether, whether I, we, we like it or not, Facebook has had uh, incredible contributions to technology in particular open source technology over the last 10 years, which is great. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to see that. Um, We've all, we're also a founding member of the Cello Alliance for Prosperity, which is like, uh, you know, at the time of announcement and the time of launch was kind of viewed as this like a little more grassroots, less like corporate uh, version of kind of what Libra was trying to do with the association. Um, it's funny because when, I guess when the media came out around it, when the, when the press came out around it, I didn't realize that that was happening until the press talked about it. I was sort of like, these are just two different blockchains that are with two different goals that are trying to, <laughs> trying to do two different things. Um, so, uh, you know, to answer your question more pointedly, um, yeah, I think that that's probably an accurate depiction. Like the, the, you know, the folks in some of the polka dot ecosystems or the cello ecosystems are a little bit more, um, grassroots developer focused, uh, maybe they're smaller startups or getting, you know, getting kind of excited about it, but there's still a ton of, of big players that are really interested in doing a ton of work in the space. Um, you know, we, we announced a partnership with Coinbase where, uh, we are, uh, uh, helping Coinbase uh, power their staking infrastructure for their custody customers on networks like uh, Polkadot and Solana. Um, so, you know, the big, big crypto companies are still focused on some of these networks as well. And, um, and, and, and we're, you know, that's really exciting for us. Um, at the same time, you know, the Libra Association definitely is made up of a whole bunch of pretty big companies. In fact, Bison Trails uh, is one of the smallest companies and um, they came to us and, you know, uh, when they were before they announced the project and they were like, Hey, we've heard you're doing incredible work in the infrastructure space. We need a company that can help us actually build out this, <laughs> this network. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's why they invited us to join. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I would say that the, the companies that are involved are definitely like big companies. We're talking Spotify and Uber and Lyft and Shopify and, uh, you know, Facebook and, you know, some really, really heavy hitters in the tech space. Um, but I would say that the folks that are working on Libra within those companies are just as enthusiastic and just as excited about crypto as any of the sort of, you know, grassroots community members that we're seeing in places like, uh, in ecosystems like Polkadot or Ethereum. And so that, that to me has been one of the most interesting things is that it doesn't really matter where you look, 
the folks that care about blockchain and crypto care a lot about blockchain and crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you can be taking different avenues to try and get to this end result of, you know, democratize access to finance, democratize access to, uh, to, you know, value store and transfer. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we've been protocol agnostic is because making a judgment call on which avenue or which strategy is going to be the best one seems sort of silly at this point. It's still very early in the market. Uh, and we'd like to help support all these different tech ecosystems grow. And, you know, I, I, I think you're the perfect person to ask uh, this question as well, because, you know, when, when your whole job or your, your whole company exists, because this is a very new technology that is not easy to use. The, it is not user friendly. The barrier for entry is very high. Um, and because, and, and you know, like you said, this is a very, very new technology. And so the focus has been on innovating, uh, adding functionality, um, interoperability, sharding, scaling, but not really user experience that hasn't really been the number one priority. And, and so I'd have to guess that, that at Libra, you know, one of the big totem poles of requirements for the Libra network and using it has to be an easy user experience that has a very low barrier of entry that looks good, works great, is hard to mess up. You're going to send it. You're not going to send, uh, you know, um, any value to a, a, a random string of address. I'd have to imagine that that's what it's going to be. So, so it, one, am I correct in my assumption? And two, you know, is this going to be the push? Is that going to, are we going to see a trickle down effect of, you know, when Libra launches with a really easy to use, good looking and nice interface? Are we going to see that kind of trickle down into the rest of the blockchain sphere? Because essentially, like in this space, and we'll touch upon with DeFi, it's all, it's either it's open source or you're just going to copy the code. So are we going to see the, essentially that kind of that trickle down effect of good UI UX? I think, um, I think as more and more people get into the crypto space, UI and UX matters more, you know, full stop. And I think that um, sometimes when, and, and me included, uh, as builders in the crypto space, uh, we, don't, we don't realize that um, there's still a massive, massive opportunity for folks to join blockchain and crypto technology. Um, you know, I, I think you know, there's, there's in the, let's just call it tens of millions you know, maybe low hundreds of millions of people that interact with uh, blockchain and crypto, um, you know, even ha have ever, not even regularly, have ever interacted with blockchain and crypto. So I think there's a tremendous, a tremendous amount of opportunity there for growth. Um, and as more people get involved, the UI UX matters more, for sure, without, without a doubt. Um, I think that one of the things that Libra brings to the table that other protocols, uh, that is unique to Libra, that maybe uh, other protocols don't have a stronger advantage in, is that it, it, there's um, massive uh, ecosystems that exist that are a part of the Libra Association. So think about all the folks that use uh, Uber, all the folks that use Spotify, all the folks that use Facebook, all the folks that uh, use all the products and services of the companies in the Libra Association that are all coming together to unify and create an experience that works interoperability, that works in between these systems. Um, and so when you think about like UI UX, it's not just about, you know, is there an app that I can use and it makes it hard to like, accidentally send 20 Bitcoin to someone that I didn't mean to. I mean, if you're sending 20 Bitcoin to someone you didn't mean to. You're, <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. Good for them. <laughs> you're doing all right for yourself right now. Um, but, uh, but, but more so, you know, that there's an entire ecosystem baked into it where, uh, you know, the, 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 the network itself is powering things that interrupts automatically by default with, with these different, uh, these different, you know, big products and services we all already use. So that's, that's a, a, a very, very strong selling point or driving point that will also drive, think, like you said, things like uh, improvements to UI and UX in the space. Um, so yes, I think that uh, I think that, that there will be that trickle down. And I think in a lot of ways, Libra has sort of pushed a lot of folks to focus on UI and UX. And in the last, even just two years, um, we've seen a huge jump in the experience around using, uh, using crypto. Uh, you know, th things like the Argent wallet is, I think is one of the best experiences in crypto. Sure, it's like not, you know, there's still some nuances to crypto that makes it hard to use, um, but it's way easier than, you know, th than some of the previous iterations of, uh, you know, keeping keys, storing keys, sending sending assets. Um, and so, so that's really, really incredible. 
Um, the thing that the thing that uh, always gets me, and I think this is actually really important to note, and it's important for Bison Trails as an infrastructure company, um, is that I my belief is that you know five years, ten years down the road, all of the software products and services we use will have some form of crypto network blockchain component to them, all of them, whether it's for transferring for whether it's for finance or for marketplaces or for commerce or for data, they all will. And I think what will happen is that folks won't even know that they're using blockchain or crypto. It's not even, it's not like I currently think about the fact that I'm using HTTP to like browse the internet or that I'm using, you know, mail protocols to send email. I just use email and I just use the internet and most people don't even think about it. So uh, I think like there's this, there's this kind of mantra around like mainstream adoption of crypto. And one of the reasons why we think what we're doing is so important because I believe that mainstream adoption of crypto starts with the companies that are building on top of crypto networks. And that's why we're trying to enable that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, I, once again, I'm not sure really what you're allowed to say, but it, <laughs> how far along is Libra on a technical level? As in, I'm not asking politically when they're going to get the okay to, to launch it, but essentially, if there wasn't such big names behind it, if this was just a crypto project, yeah. you know, it probably would have been launched already yeah, in, in terms of where it is technically. I mean, so is that what's holding it back? Is it technically not there yet or is it politically not there yet? Yeah. So um, first caveat is that I'm not a official rep like, you know, speaker representation of the Libra Association. So I don't want to like. Great. Venture. So you're not liable. You could say whatever you want. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a member of the Libra Association. So I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm part of that this association. And so we all work together. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, misrepresent from, from the entire association. Um, I am, however, on the technical steering committee, so I, I don't want to talk to the politics and the regulatory side of things. I, I mean, I know that it's a we're working really, really hard with regulators around the world as an association to um, to you know, get their approval and get uh, get the sort of thumbs up and green light for the for the project itself. On the technology side, I've been nothing but impressed. Honestly, that's that's the truth. It's an incredible uh, technical feat. The the network is is really really great. They've uh, you know. As, as an association, we've uh, built a really, really cool implementation of a Byzantine fault tolerant network. Uh, and um, there's some of the smartest people that I've, I've ever worked with that are working on it. Um, things like Move, like I said, uh, is also incredible. And the best part about it is that it's open source. So you can actually go to your GitHub, you can go to the Libra GitHub and see it. And, and uh, you know, it's actively under, uh, under development. So folks are still building on it. And um, we have uh, an open source uh, proposal process as well that folks can submit uh, changes to the project and, um, and then this committee will go over and, and, and approve them. And so um, it's really quite cool. I mean, from a technology perspective, it's made a ton, a ton, a ton of progress. So, um, you know, all that being said, like, I still think that almost every uh, blockchain protocol is still very early in its life cycle and that, um, you know, it still needs to be tested at scale, right? So, you know, Libra not being a live network that, you know, billions of people are currently using means that it has never had billions of people using it. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's a thing that needs to, to be tested. So um, I'm super optimistic on the tech side. All right. Well, you know, I'll, I'll leave you alone with Libra uh, for, for now, because I do want to touch upon uh, your thoughts on DeFi. Uh, sure. You know, you, you are an infrastructure company and you know, it, this is a very, even in blockchain standards, this is a relatively new, uh, application, especially the way it's being used today with the yield farming, uh, is, is, is really a, kind of a, a totally different space than where we were a couple of years ago. So yeah. um, I, I, as someone who does, like, like you mentioned, your, your company kind of came from this idea that everything's in beta and, we wanna, and we're, we're trying to make things work as securely as possible and, and as, as risk-free, let's say, as possible. Um, how, what's your view on DeFi there, where, especially the way it's being used today? Um, you know, where, where, where there's forks being forked up at Uniswap now because SushiSwap has been so successful. I mean, kind of what, what's your, let's go, let's start with macro. What's your view of DeFi? Then, then we'll, we'll kind of dive into it. Yeah. Okay. So macro, um, DeFi has been one of the most impressive uh, applications of, uh, of, you know, blockchain and crypto technology um, to date. So um, right now I'd say that Bitcoin probably is one of the most impressive store of value applications in the blockchain space. So Bitcoin is, has been acting as an incredible store of value. Um, Ethereum has been a phenomenal developer community. Uh, and I would say that DeFi or decentralized finance has been, while it's an aggregation or amalgamation of different pieces of technology, has been an incredible vertical that we've seen grow really, really quickly and 
innovated on really, really quickly uh, in the last, you know, call it, honestly, you said two years, but I would even call it like a year. Um, I still remember going to a DeFi meetup two years ago at, at, that we hosted at our office that had seven people at it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and this was only two years ago. So, um, so on, at the macro level, I think it's an incredible uh, implementation of, uh, of the technology. And I think that, you know, that, that is nothing to scoff at, um, you know, with, what is it, close to, I don't know what the numbers are today, but let's just say close to $10 billion in total value locked in, in DeFi contracts. That's pretty impressive. Um, that's not nothing. It's not sort of, a, you know, mini experiment. So macro and, level, and I, incredible. Yeah. And, and just like you, I, I also do remember going to crypto conferences and, and the main stage would be one thing. DeFi was not on the main stage. DeFi was that side stage workshop thing that a couple of guys would go to. And, and it's interesting because then it was thought of as a very different thing. And, you know, as you hear DeFi, oh, decentralized finance. You know, this is interesting. This is kind of anyone could be a bank. This could open up a whole uh, realm of opportunities and, and kind of, and I think, at least when I first heard it, I thought a lot more, I guess, altruistically, I think that's a little naive, but, but even I think a little more dynamically. Because right now, what I'm seeing today, for the most part in DeFi, is people taking lending and borrowing tools mm -hmm. and, and essentially not really giving out loans so people can then go open up a business or do anything. But they're, they're, they're providing liquidity just so they can get governance tokens and LP tokens, then just so then they could give more liquidity to kind of just pile upon and, and, and kind of hope that that, that that pile keeps on stacking up. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's, that definitely, I don't think was, that definitely wasn't my vision of DeFi when I first heard about it. And I don't think that was a lot of people's vision of DeFi. So is this the real DeFi? Is, is the yield farming we're seeing today? Is that really what the potential that DeFi holds? Is it the correct way? Is it the way that's going to be adoption? Or, or is there something totally different uh, uh, at the end of the day? I'm probably going to get, get yelled at for saying this. But no, this is not the real DeFi. Uh, this is great. This is a really great way to experiment on new technologies, try new contracts, uh, experiment with things like leverage and, and, and you know, over leverage or under leverage, uh, experiment with things like uh, you know, what are essentially amount to derivatives on top of assets, uh, you know, not, not to get into the whole conversation of like what is and isn't um, from, a, from a definition perspective. But um, so what's really impressive to me is kind of really what I was saying earlier, which is the pace of innovation in DeFi is insane. Like right now it's insane. So, you know, do I think that like DeFi is just going to be an amalgamation of like, you know, liquidity providers that are then over leveraging their assets. So then look, provide more liquidity for the same people that are using <laughs> liquidity providers. Like, no, I, I think that that's kind of silly, but it does kind of show how do fractional systems work in, in decentralized finance? Um, how can we replicate some of the existing systems in centralized finance in a decentralized way? And they're honestly quite experimental. So I'm excited by the pace of innovation. I'm excited by the experimentation and I'm excited by the brave people that are willing to put their money on the line, put their code on the line. That's incredible to me. And um, I know personally, I'm, I'm really excited and, and sort of, you know, messing around, playing around with a bunch of different pieces, but do I believe that the existing DeFi system is like the DeFi we've all been waiting for? No, definitely not. I think that uh, it, like you said, maybe it's altruistic. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm also too altruistic, but uh, I, it's much bigger than what we're seeing today. What we're seeing today is like rapid, rapid innovation on the systems that are going to be the fundamental building blocks for the DeFi of the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't even think, I think altruistic is too nice of a word. I, I guess <laughs> I imagine, hey, if everyone could be a bank, then we, maybe we don't have to let the banks fuck us every time with fees and this. And, the, you know, if the banks are holding all the money, great, they can do whatever they want. But, you know, if there's actually decentralized banking, decentralized finance, it'll, it'll open up. So, I think profit's still going to drive, uh, it's still going to be the motivation, but I, I hope in a, in a way that's be better for us all. But, um, you know, as a startup, you said you've been starting tech startups your whole life um, and you got acquired by Etsy and, 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 you know, you start a startup, you put in the effort, you put in the work, uh, you come up with the idea. And then when you get acquired, you get that payoff. And, and, and this discussion has come up recently with, with SushiSwap and Chef Nomi, uh, kind of, mm -hmm. Take, taking the, the, the fund and selling it off and then since give it back because he, everyone gave him shit for it. But kind of where do you fall on this? Because, you know, in, in the real world, in the traditional world, in the, in the outside of blockchain world, you build something, people use it, 
you, you got to sell it off for, for whatever price. So where do you fall on this idea? Should he have given the money back? Should he not have given the money back? Uh, should, does he deserve that money? Uh, well, it's certainly not up to me to decide whether or not he deserves, th th whether or not they deserve the money. I don't know if it's a person or uh -huh. many people mm -hmm. or not, but uh, it's certainly not up to me that. Um, I, you know, maybe to a fault, I'm a believer in capital systems. And uh, I personally, this isn't like a company belief, but my personal, my personal uh, hope was that he, that they didn't give the money back because I actually think this is a really great learning opportunity for the ecosystem. This is how it works, right? Like this, this personality had access to this treasury and they were able to leave with it. Um, and we all, we all contributed to the success of the rapid success of sushi, but also the rapid decline of sushi. Um, you know, there's definitely collateral damage in that. And that sucks. There's lots of people that were like really excited about like something that was, you know, going to the moon and put a bunch of money into it. And then like they lost the value of that money. That's, that's terrible. And I, you know, I think people need to do their own homework and they need to understand what the risks are and they can't just get all excited about the hype and throw dollars into something. Um, so I, I was actually, <laughs> I was actually kind of bummed when I found out that uh, Chef Nomi gave the money back. Cause I was kind of like, this is a great lesson for all of us. Like, you know, this is a fork. There's, these are unknown entities. These, you know, this is, this was, this, this is the system. The system that was built is this. And um, I think the lesson there was, you know, we need to understand the systems better before we just kind of throw money at the problem. Um, so this was like a really cool, I, like, I don't think what happened with sushi swap will happen identically again, you know? And, and I think like time that something like this happens, it's a really great lesson for everybody in the DeFi space. And, and this is exactly what I'm talking about in, when I, in terms of rapid innovation and, and you know, uh, the, the pace at which the, the space is moving. So, um, you know, I, if, in, a, in a perfect world, there would be a way where that lesson would be learned where there wasn't like, you know, you know folks that only had, you know, a thousand dollars and they put it into this and lost that thousand dollars. Cause don't get me wrong. I think that that's terrible too. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that those, those folks recover and they don't, you know, hate, DeFi and they don't hate crypto because of, of because of that experience. Um, but I, I also think like this highlights that we need to learn a lot more about what we're doing, why we're doing it. I, I would be willing to bet that most people that are yield farming don't understand the like, leverage risk around what they're doing right now. <laughs> I think that, like that's some a, that's, that, not that's really that's a really interesting point because every person I've spoken to on this DeFi conference so far actually said the opposite. They said. <laughs> Listen, it, it, it might, yield farming and DeFi, right now it might be the biggest bubble. It's high risk. You know, Chef Nomi can run away with it. But at least the barrier for entry in, in, in yield farming is so high. If you're yield farming, you probably understand what's going on. You probably understand this isn't beta. This is, this is forks. Your money could be gone like that. You could also, where else are you getting 100 APY? If you're getting over 100% APY, clearly there's so, you know, this isn't like, uh, you know, there's no free money. So, you know, where do you fall on that fence? Because to an extent, they are right. Right now, as opposed to the ICO boom, or, or, or let's say, obviously, uh, uh, you know, a, a regular traditional positive scheme, super easy. Anyone can take money and give it to a person. Yeah. Now let's go to the, the ICO boom. Let's say they were, uh, besides the legitimate projects popping up, there also were scam projects. Yep. And even that wasn't the hardest thing to buy. You sign up for an exchange, you buy. But, but yield farming, I mean, for someone to actually even have be yield farming, have, uh, you know, be in sushi swap and have it. You do need a, a pretty good understanding or at least of the, of the crypto sphere um, yeah. enough to the point where I, I, mean, I would feel comfortable saying that, Hey, you know what you're getting into. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's a good point. I think that um, you're probably right in that there is a high enough barrier to entry into, to, to being in like a really leveraged position in DeFi um, that you should know what you're doing. Um, but I'm not convinced that everyone who is doing it isn't just reading a guide somewhere on Twitter and being like, well, I'll just like do this because I like, can, you know, other people are doing it and it, it kind of makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm not, I'm not convinced. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the alternative, the alternative viewpoint to that, which I think is totally fair is like everyone in DeFi that's yield farming knows what they're doing. They know what the risks are and uh, let's keep leveraging each other's sort of participation to hasten the pace of innovation, to make it even faster, you know, and, and um, that might be the way better position to take, you know, just like, yeah, well, it's risky. You're in it. So <laughs> enjoy well, the risk. That's what, 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's what, that's where I, I think that, you know, with, with the urine finance, uh, which has skyrocketed, uh, you know, recently, um, it, it, it's great, but also holds this danger because now all of a sudden you just lower the barrier for entry. You know, I don't understand how to yield farm. I can't be hopping on top of this, this thing. Switch it. No. Okay. I'll give it to them. They'll do the yield farming for me. They claim they're going to get the best APY. And so all of a sudden now what you've done is you've now created an opportunity. By the way, I'm not saying that's, that's wrong or right. I'm just saying there now is the opportunity for people who really don't understand the risks that are going in. Because, it, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Think about it. If you're not already familiar with crypto, or right, if you're just from the traditional world, and you hear 3% APY, you're excited. And yeah. now you're coming, and now someone's telling you, wait a second, there's this 100% APY, and you don't even have to do anything. You just put it in, the, in, in this urine, and, 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 it, and it algorithmically follows the best thing. I mean, now I think it's so funny, because this pace of innovation, the innovation is always causing more problems than a blow up. And then, so, I mean... <laughs> Where is this heading? What, what, where do you see this leveling off? I mean, I, I, you know, with the, with the ICOs, it kind of was the crash of the price mixed with the mixed with, you know, enough scams kind of getting people, uh, you know, fed up with it. How do you see this ending with DeFi? You know, where is that tipping point? Yeah, I, I love the way you frame that question, because uh, what it does is it actually lays out this idea that um, with the BS that came with the ICO bubble and boom, you actually got an incredible amount of capital that flowed into really legitimate, really incredible product, product projects and, and protocols. Um, and I think we're going to see the same thing with DeFi. So, um, you know, you know, Chef Nomi and Sushi is, is one instance. And, and I don't even think, you know, I'm not sure, but I don't even think there was any real malice in that. It was just sort of like poorly decision, poor, poor decision making or, or, you know, poor management. Um, well, there'll probably be more scams. There'll be more things that are malicious. There'll be more things where people lose money and get angry. But the idea is that at the end of the day, when all is said and done, you end up at a higher plateau than you were when we started. So you can't argue with the fact that there's you know way more contracts that are being deployed into Ethereum that are interacting with each other and folks that are using them right now. That's incredible. I mean, I can't even send ETH to, between two of my different wallets because the price of gas is too high. Like just in trying to solve that problem is like in itself interesting. Like even if DeFi, like all DeFi does is highlight like, hey, if we use Ethereum, it's too expensive to use. Uh, we have to solve that problem. Like that to me is like worth it, you know? Like, so, so I think that what we're going to end up with is a technology ecosystem around Ethereum and around other protocols uh, that are going to support, you know, smart contracting or that do support smart contracting um, that's higher than it was before. Um, and that's what happened with the, the ICO boom too, right? Lots, lots more crypto projects. Um, sadly, there was, you know, a lot of BS that went with it. So the best thing we could do is try to help our friends, you know, collectively help everyone we know and help them avoid the scams and help them avoid the BS. And, you know, a lot of times when it looks too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true for the most part, you know, I'm not saying everything. Um, and ideally we end up at a higher plateau than we were last year. And, and, and you know, and, and one of the things that, that, you know, you mentioned this, the kind of high gas prices, right? It's essentially unusable for the average, just regular person who just wants yeah. to send money, unless you're doing some really crazy things. Uh, has this, do you think this has incentivized a, a, a quicker push to Ethereum 2.0 or actually decentivized, decentivized the, 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 a quick push to 2.0? That's a good, that's also a good question. I think that ETH 2.0, um, I think what this is doing is highlighting the value that some of the newer protocol uh, designs uh, uh, give to the crypto ecosystem. So whether it's ETH 2.0 or it's Polkadot or it's a Cosmos or uh, some one of these other newer uh, technology platforms shows that you can have some of this, uh, some of these you know, transaction volume without necessarily having gas prices skyrocket and make it unusable. Um, I think it's probably accelerating the ideas of like, well, if we actually use this thing at scale, which I still think even with DeFi, Ethereum is not at scale. I think like we're not even close to global financial decentralized finance scale. So uh, it needs to be usable for the average person. So these are real problems that we're highlighting in, in using in using uh, Ethereum. So yeah, I think it's pushing towards ETH too. I think it is. I think it's pushing towards other protocols as well. And people are looking at other ways, whether they're layer twos or new, new layer ones uh, to, to service the needs of the users. And that's great. That's good for everyone. Mm -hmm. And and has Bison Trails been developing also 
um, solutions for DeFi as well? So we've been, um, this is a question that's hard to really wrap your head around unless you really understand the technology. So we've, we've been heavily, heavily focused on infrastructure at the protocol level. So message propagation, securing, validating, proof of stake, governance, those kinds of things. Uh, all of the DeFi systems that are currently being built, whether they're automated market makers or DEXs, are built on top of protocols that assume a certain level of security. So they're built on top of Ethereum. People are securing Ethereum. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're built on top of Polkadot or Tezos. People are securing those networks. Um, and Bison Trails fo focuses on securing the, the, the protocols themselves and making them usable. So if you're building a product or service that interacts with potentially Ethereum, uh, you might be using Bison Trails infrastructure to read and write from the, to and from the network. Um, so it's not so much that we're building products for DeFi, but we're building a lot of the first principles and fundamentals that support a DeFi ecosystem that can grow and can be used in this way. Um, we're less focused on like necessarily, you know, I don't know, tools to like optimize yield farming or anything like that. You know, we're really focused on um, the, the fundamental layers. And last question, total yeah. hypothetical, totally out there. Um, uh, bef before I let you go, uh, let's say Bison Trails, uh, you seem like a very smart guy and you just keep on killing the game. You guys keep getting more customers and you got, and your technology is underpinning uh, tons of proof of stake, tons of nodes. I mean, you, you literally get to the point where, where essentially by your fingertip, you actually have a, a pretty centralized uh, control of, of a large, large portion uh, of the crypto sphere. Yeah. Um, do you pull the plug? <laughs> do, you, do you say, do you say, no, no, but not pull the plug and bring it down. But I'm saying put, kind of blow up the key as in, as in, do you say I have become too powerful and kind of, and kind of, you know, take off the steering wheel and throw it away so no one else could use it? Yeah, no, I, I, I was joking. I completely understand the question. Um, I, uh, so what you're describing is, um, it, it's really interesting because when we started this company, we started it with the idea that we wanted to help support distribution, decentralization uh, of these net, of, of networks. Um, and I'm actually not a firm believer in like pure 100% decent, perfect decentralization. I kind of think it's sort of bullshit and people will draw a line in the sand wherever they think is convenient for them. Um, you know, people ignore the fact that like, every computer system in the world is basically running on Linux. And that's like a centralized vector, you know, like some flavor of it. Um, not that that's necessarily a problem, but what we do is we build in, in technology solutions and systems to mitigate against those risks. And so when we started building Bison Trails, we were acutely aware that we were trying to help build and forward these decentralized world, the decentralized you know, technology world. Um, and so we have a track at work within Bison Trails. It's always focused on how do we further decentralization so the answer to your question is, I hope we never get to a point where we're actually in that seat where I have to say like, hey, should we pull the steering wheel off and throw it, uh, throw it off? It's more, we, how do we provide, build and provide technology solutions so that we never get to that seat? Um, and I think that we're, we're not, I think we are currently working on a lot of different uh, implementations and, and pieces of tech that can help us do that. And um, it'll, you know, it'll take different forms. It'll be things like that we open source. It'll be things that, um, we have really strict access control around. We have things about like ownership and, and, and keys. And, um, and, and really the way we view it is let's not let that be a limiting factor on our imaginations on how we can build this decentralized future. And let's assume that that's a technology solution that we can solve. Uh, this is a technology problem that we can solve. And, and that's, the, that's the, the path we've taken. And I, I firmly believe that. So I hope I'm never in that position is the answer to your question. Um, and that as a company, we're working really hard to never get to that position. Says the guy who thinks that Chef Nomi should have taken that money and run. Joe, either live, either die a hero or live long enough to see, see yourself become a villain. Joe, thank you so much for, for, for joining me, taking the time to kind of peel the veil of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, I really appreciate it. And for all our viewers at home for Reimagine 2020, I'm Yon Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.